The AA Circuit of Ireland Rally is now the longest stage rally in the world. But is it the ultimate challenge or a dinosaur that is too expensive for most competitors? And an event that the Ulster Automobile Club would be better to trim to current rallying trends? Only 45 crews will start the main event, but with an excellent entry in the historic competition, which runs concurrently with the AA Circuit, there is plenty to keep the public amused. From the breakfast time start in Bangor on Good Friday, the New Look route starts its clockwise swing around Ireland, bringing the rally to its second home in Limerick on Friday night. But first, there are a few little extra tasks to be undertaken. A Secretary of State has to be instructed on how to start the event. And what's that old saying about too many cooks spoiling something? You'll probably hear him shouting the time as well from inside the car. You'll say go in the same time as you've said 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. A world champion can't be ignored, especially if he packs a punch like this one. Well, it's, it's a dangerous game like boxing, isn't it? I'll have a go at it maybe in the future. Well, another world champion had a go at it and uh, he ended up hitting the cars nearly as hard as he hit the opponent. It's very boring with Morgan. He's, he might hear when he had a go and I think I'll just have a, a go because I think all boxers like dangerous sports and something they get here is really dangerous. <laughs> And talking of world champions, the ladies' world rally champion has been persuaded out of retirement. Louise, we thought you'd given all this up and we wouldn't see you back in Ireland again in a competitive car. What are you doing in historic rallying? Well, BT Crawford phoned up and asked if I would like to drive his car in the circuit of Ireland, post 9-11, on the historic. Couldn't refuse. So uh, decided to come out of retirement and uh, enjoy Ireland again. Paddy Hopkirk, one of the greatest circuiteers of all time, is in town to introduce us to Daewoo Cars on the event that he won many times and that introduced him to big time rallying over a quarter of a century ago. And the bill are also on the beat. Jerry Caprio and John Ashton from Sheffield will be in hot pursuit in their Austin A70. Hystericals, they are often called. But at the serious end of the field, it looks like a two horse race between two recent winners. We're looking forward to the rally, but it's, it's going to be a good race, but it's. It's a long rally and it's a very, very tough rally this year, so the uh, stages are very, very hard and um, we've had a fairly uh, strenuous recce, you could say, you know, um, getting over the entire route three times in five days. It's hard no way to tackle it, you know, you could go flat out from where to go and I think there's no car would stick it at that pace throughout the whole event, so it's, it's we want to see what, what the weather does and, and plan it basically as we go along. You know, if you can make very good pace notes uh, driving at 30, 40 miles an hour, uh, and you know, make them properly. You should be fit to drive at rally speeds on them, and uh, that's all part of the trick, you know. Rob is a new co-driver, so we decided <clears throat> we need to do an event to get to know each other, and plus to get into each other's notes. So uh, we decided the circuit was the best event for that. Well, you've got a, a co-driver with a bit of a track record, and uh, you know a little bit about the circuit yourself. But the car is absolutely brand new. Yeah, it's brand new for this event, and uh, there's a few special things. We've done a fantastic job. It was. Uh, Ten men built it in eight days, so it's, uh, they've done a great job with the car, and uh, we tested it yesterday, and I'm very pleased with it. The car is exactly the same as it was uh, for Galway, and it, you know, for Galway, had nothing changed from last year, so uh, no, the car hasn't changed. Um, we've had the engine rebuilt, and obviously the car has been refettled from every screw has been checked, and uh, you know, the car should be good. You know, okay. Liam, the car is looking as lovely as ever. How's it going to go over the next four days? It's going to go well, I think. Um, on the last outing in West Cork, the car was much improved over Galway, and uh, we learned that we've learned a lot about it. So I'm I'm really hopeful now of a good result. The top three seeds blast off the start line, but there are others to be reckoned with as well. At number four, the former national champion Ian Greer in his Toyota GT4. At number six is the 1993 circuit winner and three times tarmac champion Austin McHale in a similar car. Here's another national champion, Mickey Farrell, in his Subaru Legacy. And at number seven, potentially one of the fastest rivals to the top three seeds, Andrew Nesbitt. 
Hamilton's Folly is a very tough way to start a 36-stage event, and Bertie Fisher is giving the tough Mac Carr a tough time over this infamous county down jump. But despite his dramatic flight, he is not the early leader. However, by Newry, he has occupied his expected perch at the head of the field. Stephen Finlay will arrive at the border turn just three seconds in arrears. The predictions look to be correct. Fisher, the 1995 winner, and Finlay, the 1994 victor, are already engaged in a combat that is thrilling the huge crowds as they line the stages. Liam O'Callaghan in the Esso Toyota is very aware of the enormity of the task ahead and he is playing himself in at his own pace. You get a good indication of the severity of the Hamilton Folly jumps from inside the Toyota. It's not the place to give your car any unnecessary early punishment. Junction left seven. Liam Language is in fourth, some 24 seconds behind the leader. But here's someone who is upsetting the script. Andrew Nesbitt, with the experienced George Miller in the notes, sets fastest time on the first two stages to go into an early lead. The Philip White Tars Toyota is flying, and by Newry, he is still in touch with the top two. Just eight seconds in arrears of Fisher. Ian Greer is experiencing some brake fade in the older model GT4. But Luke McCarthy will be one of the first major retirements when he parks his Sierra on stage four. Like Ian Greer, Austin is also experiencing brake problems and the Dubliner is back in an unaccustomed sixth place. Mickey Farrell has burst a tire on a previous stage. And he lies in seventh position. But Jay Jordan, who went so well in the event last year, will not make it to Newry. Let's go leaping with the Doyle brothers in the NIIB Honda. Their aim is to win the new Formula 2 category, but the Group A Civic that they had hoped to have for the event has not materialised, so it's flat out in the old Group N car. Henry, a beautiful day for the spectators. How's it going for you? So far, so good. We're trying to make it steady. It's a long way. It's a very tough rally. There's only uh, three or four stages over at this stage. It's a long, long road to Limerick and back through Galway, Sligo, and back into Bangor. Any excitement this morning? Um, not really. Hampton's Folly was very bumpy, so with a few bumps there, but other than that, everything's going okay for us. In every event, there's one crucial stage that seems to change the whole character of the weekend. And the Devil's Elbow, just south of Newry, will provide many headlines in the 1996 circuit. So get the cameras out, boys. We're right on the elbow as the rally leader approaches and executes a copybook handbrake turn. But just down the road, as David Coulter's excellent pictures show, Bertie blots that copybook in a big way.
it was a scary one. It happened at a place where, um, when we were wrecking, it's a place where the border, just on a border checkpoint, and uh, the guards were always at that particular junction, and we always had to stop there. And we we're always coming down there quite cautious and wanting to be, uh, not to be having, getting a ticket off from the guards. So um, we were quite lucky. It was probably an 80 mile an hour accident, and uh, we had the car in the drain, and I suppose fortunately enough, I was had the presence of mind to keep the power on. Otherwise, we would have definitely crashed against the bank. But kept the power on, and just unfortunately, as the back wheel came out of the drain, it seemed to hit something very, very solid. The car spun through 180 degrees in midair and landed across the crossroads. Stephen may be the new leader, but he's not without his worries. A cap has vibrated off the rocker cover, and the escort is spewing out oil. Many of the top men will remember stage five. Andrew Nesbitt performs an unusual manoeuvre at the elbow, captured by our own and Kieran Clarkin's cameras. You can see just how tight the first part of this stage is from inside O'Callaghan's car. But despite having the widest car in the rally, Liam is third fastest on this test. Left four, 20, left seven, 25, right seven, tight. Repeat, right seven, tight. Caution, press left six over, jump to rocks. Right six minus, stop. Caution, press right seven, rocks. Right seven, sun, left seven. Junction left D, tight. Brace yourself now as James O'Brien reads the notes and we approach the crossroads that has been Fisher's Folly. Lift into right four plus, 70. Crest one and left three, 40. Crest into left seven. Seven. You jump right two on the crossroads and left two. 25, right one, 30. Right five into left seven minus, seven minus. But even with his frightening moment, Bertie has managed to stay ahead of Ian Greer, who's now in fifth place. With Mickey Farrell over a minute behind the Toyota in sixth. But say goodbye to Austin McHale. The Dubliner won't make it to his home city due to a failure in the power steering pump. Eamon McAleenan is motoring along in fine style, but he's encountered early delays when his engine kept cutting out. Cahill Arthurs leads the two-wheel drive contingent in his Eurocable's Manta, despite this little mishap. Indeed, many could benefit from going back to basics when it comes to the old auto test art of handbrake turns. Donald Bones has great difficulty negotiating the elbow. As does Willie John Dolan. And in fairness, it should be pointed out that some four-wheel drive cars don't have a separate brake to the rear wheels. But that would be no excuse for Michael Smallwood. Or Nick West. Let Kevin Barrett and Paul Fox show you how it should be done. But the elbow action is only beginning to warm up. Mark and Rory Doyle have been on their roof and they arrive with us in a major state of confusion. It might be wise to call it a day at this point, but giving up is not in the rally man's book, and certainly not in Mark's makeup. They'll struggle out of the stage and onto Dublin. That's not an option available to Ted Johnson. Ted has bounced his Lancia off one of those rocks, and the Integrale is now blocking the stage. It's all very embarrassing for gentleman Ted and his rather less delicate co-driver. The suspension is in the ditch, 
John Dempsey, Mark Nagel and James Tollerton are in a rage. While journalist Nell McCafferty, who's visiting her first rally, is totally confused. How can a wheel fall off a car? Huh? <laughs> Delicate little animal. But when you ain't got no suspension, you ain't got no go. Nigel White is luckier than most, as he doesn't lose time. But he's kind enough to stop to see if his friend is all right. You meet a nicer class of person further down the timesheets. By Dublin, the rally is running very late due to the holiday traffic. And amazingly, the Doyle brothers are still with us. The voluntary helpers in the NIIB team have performed miracles in the little Honda. And although it would not win any concourse awards, it's driving normally again. The organisers are now in big diffs. Encouraged by heavy promotion, Dubliners have flocked in their thousands to see the Sally Gap stage. But now the crowds are too large to handle in safety, and the UAC, with great reluctance, decides to cancel the stage. Sadly, the only action that the disappointed fans will see today on the Dublin Mountains will come from the historic runners. Lessons will have been learnt from this unfortunate occurrence, but for now the club must simply apologise. Safety can never be compromised. At last the action has resumed on the AA Circuit of Ireland rally, with Finlay determined to capitalise on the gift of time that has been handed to him by his rival. A little too keen at this junction, but he sets fastest times on both the evening stages. Andrew finishes just 31 seconds behind the Ballygawley driver, in what can only be described as a very good day for the Armagh man. Bertie Fisher's car is showing no ill effects from that stage five accident as he rebuilds his rally. Liam's now ahead of him and up to third, but he's had to replace a suspension strut. The Toyota is fairly fragile in that area. Loose gravel and a 90 degree left hander is guaranteed entertainment in a rear wheel drive car. Cathal Arthurs and Jim Crozier oblige. And James Armstrong in the Nissan engine Mazda really gives us a show. undoubtedly been Stephen Finlay's day. He has that 31 second lead over Nesbitt, but more importantly, almost a minute and a half between the Ford and the Subaru. The Porsche 911 has dominated historic rallying in recent years, and Jeff Crabtree, the early leader, aims to keep it that way. But Drew Wiley has other ideas. Drew hopes that his lightweight Lotus Elan is the car to end the German manufacturer's domination. The circuit will be a tough test, but variety has always been part of the appeal of the classics. Sadly, Louise Aiken Walker and B.T. Crawford's SO Porsche do not survive the Hamilton's folly switchbacks. Desi Nutt and Derek Smith also take an early bath when their Porsche succumbs to drive shaft problems. So it's a straight Porsche battle between Crabtree and the Galway winner John Coyne. John closes the gap to 41 seconds before Gabrock problems intervene, eventually leading to his retirement. John Keatley's 911 had suffered from a misfire but now seems to be going better. But the experienced Belgian driver, Henrik Bloch, already christened Breeze Bloch by his fellow competitors, is surprised at the pace of the event. I'm very surprised and uh, I, I thought I would do a lot better than I do, but okay, that's the way it is sometimes. Uh, the people that live in the country, they 
take the honors. I have rallied extensively in the United States. I've did about 138 rallies there, all over the United States, in Canada and in Mexico and Guatemala. And in 1993, I took the European Historical Championship, including winning the uh, Targa Florio rally. I had seen some videos of uh, stars like Malcolm Wilson and Billy Coleman that really raved about Ireland. So I thought I, I'm going to try it, and you can count on me being back here in Ireland. I enjoy it so much. Sadly, the engine in the Belgian's Porsche doesn't stand the pace, but Jeff Crabtree and Liz Jordan are not having an easy run home, as they're having to deal with suspension problems on their way back north. John Keatley and Morris Beckett sniff the scent of victory and try a desperate dash to the finish, to no avail. Even Drew Wiley seems to think that the door has been opened at the last minute. Not so, but his day will surely come in the nimble Lotus. Niall Crichton takes fourth in the class win in his Lotus Cortina. And the others who top their historic classes are Robert Majimsey in his MGB, Duncan Metcalf's Vauxhall Forenza, Derek Parling's Hillman Imp, Alan Lemons' Woolsey Hornet. Andy Bones, Lancia Fulvia, despite this little spin. And Raviraj Kakeras in this Volvo 122S. But we can't leave the historics without mentioning the Lotus Eater, Alan Courtney. Before retiring with hub damage, the Carrick Fergus driver was in fifth place in a pushrod engine four door Cortina. On two occasions in the past, Jeff and Liz have been robbed of circuit success at the 11th hour. But this time, their luck holds. We all had our problems at the last moment and we broke a strut box and uh, but John had terrible engine problems. So uh, we're all closing up together. They're trying to, trying to, trying to um, catch us. Liz, fingers crossed, right to the end. Yes, it was very nerve-wracking. Having had problems on the last two days for the last two years, we, it was really, this was the bogey day and we thought if we could get through this, we might get to the finish. Day two of the AA Circuit of Ireland rally is centred around the historic town of Adair with ten stages in County Limerick and Adair Manor once again hosting two spectator stages. the big boys. That's Stephen Finlay in the Group A Escort Cosworth, the rally leader, heading down towards the hairpin. And using a little bit more of the track than intended, this is the very fast section up into fifth gear and then back onto the tarmac. This is the only part of the entire rally where they encompass both loose surface and tarmac surfaces. Through the bottom hairpin, up through the gears, Again on tarmac here and up to the loose finish. And Finley has lost it over the finish line. Still, he records 58 seconds. Next man out, Andrew Nesbitt, lying in second place in his Toyota GT4. Again, four wheel drive, six speed. And over the bump there. And nearly had a bit of a disaster there, the Arma man, but uh, hopefully hasn't damaged the car. Down he comes into the hairpin. Neatly catches that slide, accelerating off through the trees. And unaware, of course, that Finley lost at this point. His time identical to Finley's, 58 seconds. What can Fisher do? The man who's on a mission, a mission to climb back up the field, lying in fourth overnight. A Subaru Legacy 555, identical to the World Championship cars, as used by Colin McRae. Rory Kennedy on the pace notes. Off they come, off and loose. A little bit sideways there. 
down into the hairpin, braking heavily. The brakes on these Group A cars are quite incredible. This is Tarmac, accelerating up through the trees again, and then a tight chicane here. And we're watching the stopwatch. He's doing a very quick time indeed. He's going to beat, I think, both Finley and Nesbitt by two seconds, it looks like. 56 seconds. Brilliant. Five, four, three, two, one, go! Left one end junction right. Now seven, let's see it from the inside with Leo Callahan and James O'Brien. The 90 20, right through the straw bales onto the loose surface. The junction left in. Up through the box. From above, we see them approaching the hairpin. Very slow, down into the first gear. Using a bit of the grass on the outside, but much neater than some of the others. Down to the rough bit. This, of course, is where we saw Nesbitt go flying onto the tarmac again. And this new Toyota is very wide, sometimes a disadvantage. Catches the slide beautifully, up through the gears, one of the faster parts of the course. The chicane lies ahead. Right, left, and a tight right. And then onto the loose again, over the finish line. It's not going to be a very quick time, but it's often been said that you cannot win rallies on spectator stages, but you can lose them. Back on the railroads, the counter-attack that we've been expecting from Fisher has arrived. Bertie is taking lumps out of Stevens' advantage. Nine seconds on stage 11, five on stage 12, one on stage 13, and probably more on 14 if the top men hadn't all been on bogey time. Finley has made a wrong tyre choice, and it's costing him a lot of time. But as the Malcolm Wilson prepared escort arrives at Rathkeel's service, Stephen doesn't seem to be unduly perturbed. Uh, this morning went out, but, but took the uh, safer option, went for softer tyres on, on the first two stages, or three stages, and uh, we lost a fair bit of time there, but we've got equal times, I think, in the last two, so can't complain. Now, you and Bertie are great friends. Uh, this is a, a real uh, good sort of uh, needle match between the two of you. Yes, it's, it's uh, what would you call revenge, I think, maybe is the best word, but ah, yeah, it's good, it's good sport, and uh, we are good friends, but when it, the countdown goes, it's every man for himself. And uh, his reputation, uh, does that uh, deter you a little bit when you see him closing in? Not really, no, we're, we're trying to keep it safe and, and you know, not do nothing stupid, but uh, yeah, he's on a real charge today, so uh, if, we can keep him, if we can keep over the minute of a lead, that's what we're aiming for and, and play it from there, basically. You're closing down the gap rapidly at the moment. It's a great uh, run between you and your good friend, Stephen. I'm not so sure about the good friend, but at this stage, mind you, that, um, no, no, we're having a good run. Stephen's going to be very hard to beat, but um, we're going to keep the pressure on. He's just the sort of guy to give you the motivation to, to really drive hard. Oh, I, there's no doubt about that. Um, but, you know, there's a long way to go in this rally, and um, anything can happen. You know, it's, it's a long way. I wouldn't certainly be uh, over-optimistic about our chances of getting in front of him, but we're certainly going to keep the pressure on. RPM's special intelligence branch seems to have uncovered a secret weapon in the O'Callaghan camp. You at every service area with these lovely pastries? I don't have us. Yeah? I, when I only see the rally car, I give them to the, him. Does it make him go faster? James, is this the secret ingredient? Please, God. Please, God. Things are going okay for you, although I believe you've recently had a problem. Yeah, the first stage, the intercooler pump failed, um, and we just got into the second stage. As we arrived in the sec just at the control of the second stage, some flames started shooting back at me out of the uh, one of the fuel boards. So uh, it was a little bit uh, exciting, to put it mildly. So a little bit disconcerting, but the unfortunate thing was the okay, the, the last stage we've just come off of. Um, we took ten seconds out of Andrew Nesbitt and Stephen Finlay, Bertie Fisher, and ourselves are all on the same time. But uh, the stage bogey is actually a minute slower, so all our hard work is for nothing. Bogey times are imposed by the organisers to ensure that an overall average of 75 miles an hour isn't exceeded on the stages. So if the quick men have too many donkeys under their right foot and beat that bogey, they're given the set time for the stage. For some, the bogey will never be a problem. 
Today, the rally traffic passes through the lovely village of Brewery, home to the De Valera Museum, amongst other attractions. There are many wondrous sights to behold on the Limerick Tipperary border, including, would you believe, a pram with wing mirrors. But the sight that's bringing out the crowds in this Easter Saturday sunshine is the titanic battle for the lead between the supercars. Easter Saturday has undoubtedly been Bertie's day. He set fastest time on every one of the day's stages. The Historics are not the only ones to have their own battles within the main event. The Group N category also wages its own personal war, and Donald Bones is the early leader in his escort, Cosworth. Sean Campbell, the current historic rally champion, is having only his second outing in a Group N car and he goes into the lead as they head for Limerick. Willie John Dolan in a similar Impreza, however, is not giving the newly driver an easy time. With Welshman Dylan Jones, where else could he be from on the notes, the Castledirk builder is just a minute and a half behind when the Campbell car develops a misfire on Saturday and Willie goes ahead. By Sunday, Campbell's car is on song again, and the former Porsche star is trying to claw back the time lost. Now both the Impresas are well inside the top ten, with Willie in seventh and Sean eighth. The tables turn again before nightfall, when Dolan encounters power steering problems, and sadly then retires on the final day, just two stages from home. Sean, congratulations. It's only taken you one rally to transfer from historics to Group N winner. Yes, I have done it the, the way around. Most people wouldn't attempt it. I was just saying to David on the way in, it might never be repeated. Historic rally winner one year and then Group N the next. Perhaps Group N one year and historic the next may be, but not the way I've done it. Well, there's only the overall to go for now, Sean. Oh, well, no, I've definitely given up on that. That is, that is not an option, Plum. This is where the AA circuit of Ireland really begins to hurt. We've already seen two hard days of rallying and now comes the longest day of all. Between Limerick and Bangor there are a further nine stages and three of them are in the dark. As Liam O'Callaghan roars up towards us along the shores of Loch Nafui in the late morning, his team still has 13 hours of rallying ahead of them. But you don't have to own a supercar to be a hero on the circuit. Fox and Billy McCullens have been in trouble from the start. Their George Weir Nova developed clutch problems on stage two due to an oil leak from the gearbox. And yet, they still led their class by four minutes going into Limerick. By the second day, their problem had got so bad that a four minute advantage was turned into a three minute disadvantage. Amazingly, the Wilson Development service crew managed to remove the clutch and gearbox, replace the faulty seal and screw it all back together again in 45 minutes. They were rewarded by a remarkable recovery drive from Paul, which brought them a class win and 13th place overall at the end of their great adventure. The Doyles have been doing wonderful things since we last saw them in Dublin. Peering through this broken screen, they've been roaring through the countryside trying to make up for that disaster on day one. Unbelievably, the Civic is mechanically fit. And apart from the eye strain of peering through a cracked windscreen, the boys are hugely enjoying their drive back up the field in the NIIB Honda. They're still hoping to catch Sean Keenan for the Formula 2 lead, but that might require miracles. Finally in our hero spot, it would seem that Keith Norton is auditioning to become Kieran O'Neill's understudy. 
All right, Keith, don't damage the lovely Liz Bailey. You've got the part. Back to reality. And the reality is that Bertie knows that he must try to break Finlay in the Mayo stages. It's the old trick. Try to demoralise the opposition in the first stage of the day, but it goes horribly wrong as David McLean's camera records. The front wheel is gone. Now we can see what that spot is like from inside the Doyle's car. And how close Bertie came in this slow-mo. The car lands on the wall, a few inches to the right and it would have been over. But rally cars are tough these days and Bertie three wheels the tough Mac car off the stage to only drop 19 seconds to Finlay. It's a major setback, but it's not defeat. Stephen will also get close to that wall. But every time that Bertie gets close, Stephen seems to get a reprieve. But let's not forget about Andrew. The Philip White Toyota is now back up to second place and only 11 seconds behind the leader. But brake problems will blunt his challenge. Ian Greer has a different challenge on his hands. Mickey Farrell in the sixth place Subaru is closing in on the Hillsborough driver. Less than a minute now separate them. The battle between the two national champions provides a perfect support act in this electrifying rally. And there are plenty of sideshows. Michael Smallwood's much mangled escort receives another modification. Fortunately, it's a soft ditch, and there is plenty of help on hand to get the Straffen driver underway. Ewell Williamson is capitalizing on these mistakes and in his first Circuit of Ireland rally in his 23-year-old car, he's having a mighty time. It's the first time in the circuit. To be loving the world is beyond belief, like to me. Really enjoy it. And your budget compared to, say, Bertie Fisher? <laughs> well, the car so far has stood me this year about seven grand. So. Seven grand wouldn't hardly cover him for the first day. Probably wouldn't cover his tire bill anyway. Now it's on up the west to Sligo. And again, Stephen is under pressure. But this time, he's holding his own. He's gained four seconds on stage 22, but loses two on each of the next two tests, making it even Stevens into Sligo. <laughs> Andrew's in trouble and drops almost a minute with rear suspension damage. This moves Bertie back up to second, but he must close in on that escort as the stage mileage is beginning to run out, especially when they encounter that bogey problem again on the last stage before the supper halt. Ahead lie the three nighttime stages, a rarity these days on the Tarmac Championship, but there's plenty of candle power to lighten the darkness. You're allowed to have a maximum of eight forward facing lights, so obviously we take maximum benefit of, uh, of whatever you can get, and they're all like 100 watt bulbs, so you've got sort of 800 watts of lamp on the front of the car. You need a very big alternator, we've got a 150 amp alternator, which is uh, it's, it's quite substantial. It wouldn't quite do your house and mine, but it's, it's getting fairly close. 
Let's experience that illumination from inside the Doyle's car as they continue to climb out of obscurity in a remarkable comeback drive. The Fermanagh and Tyrone fans are out in their thousands to cheer their local heroes who continue to battle for Ireland's biggest motoring prize. But Finlay continues to maintain that 58 second cushion in the darkness. There are still eight stages to go on the final day of this nail biter. Surely something has to give. Day four and the action transfers to County Antrim for the ultimate showdown. Can Betty snatch his second circuit victory in the final hours? It doesn't look like it! Surely this is the end. We are right at the start of an eight mile test. How can the Subaru survive this kind of treatment? But as Nick Mulholland's camera shows, Bertie is determined to salvage something from what has been a major moment. The trouble started in a jump before the bend. And now the Impreza strikes the outside bank, is out of control and severs the telegraph pole. It leaves behind a drive shaft and a cracked pole on stage 30. It seems that it's all over, bar the shouting. It certainly is for the class winners. Francis Wilson and Karen Woods win the ladies' prize and class two. Simon Welby and Alan Crummy win class nine. James Tollerton and Sid Fairfax take class five. And Mark and Rory Doyle make it home in 12th place, the class six winners and again, heroes on the circuit. Sean Keenan and Stephen O'Reardon win Formula 2 and Class 7. Ewell Williamson and Trevor Wilson win Class 11 and remarkably they're 8th overall in their 23-year-old escort. Ian Greer and Desi Wilson may have lost the battle for 5th but they win Class 12. And now for the top 5 in the longest rally in the world. 5th Michael Farrell and Anthony Nestor in the chorus Subaru. Fourth seems little reward for Bertie Fisher and Rory Kennedy after such a spectacular weekend. Second really wasn't a lot of interest to in me. It was, you know, I'm not saying it was just um, win or bust. That wasn't really the attitude we went out with this morning. We went out to try and keep Stephen under pressure. We, uh, we did keep him under pressure yesterday and on Saturday. Um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately the stages weren't being kind to us. Liam O'Callaghan and James O'Brien return to Bangor in the Esso Toyota in third place. Just. Bertie put us under a bit of pressure there later in the evening. We wanted to, to wind down a little bit and get it home, but uh, he made it a little bit harder than, than we had hoped. But we're delighted to be third. And second is a truly great result for Andrew Nesbert and George Miller. They have been right on the pace with Finlay and Fisher for most of the weekend. Ten hard days, I can assure you. And thanks to George here, we, we kept to our plan and worked out very well for us. It's Stephen Finlay's second circuit win. But Robbie Philpott's first. And a very good start to a partnership that will bring this pair into a whole new dimension of the sport when they tackle the World Championship. The consolation for Fisher is that he still tops the Tarmac Championship table, with Liam O'Callaghan emerging as his main rival. The next round is the Carling Rally of the Lakes in Killarney on the first weekend in May. Congratulations, Stephen. I suppose to be, you won this event two years ago, but this was a real, real win. Yeah, it's, it's uh, what would you call revenge, I think is the name. Uh, Bertie made it hard for us the whole way through, and uh, we're delighted. It was the best circuit we've done, and uh, just everyone went to plan, and everyone worked well, so uh, 
It's great. I have waited a, a long time to win the circuit. It was very close three or four years ago with Kenny, obviously, and that didn't work out for me. So it was a fairly ne nerve-wracking day for me all day today just to get to the finish. Absolutely delighted with it.